welcome everyone to the 451 Degrees podcast, wherein we talk about all things censorship. You can see Missy trying to work her way into the uh, stream, uh, the video already. But today we are talking about misinformation campaigns. Now, uh, misinformation campaign labels, to be even more specific on that. And joining me today is Caleb Beers. Welcome to the channel, Caleb. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am Caleb Beers. I am a uh, niche internet micro celebrity, as the meme has it. I have a YouTube channel where you can find me. Just search Caleb Beers. I'll be the first result with a few with a small but but a considerable following. Um, I've been published in several places, including The Federalist, Aereo Magazine, and Human Events. I have a piece on Foucault in Aereo Magazine, and I have a decent-sized following also on Quora.com, where I my answers are viewed approximately a million times every four months, and I have published a great deal on philosophy, social science, all the things that I think are interesting. Uh, I'm not an accredited expert in any way, shape, or form. I'm just some uh, no-name IT guy who likes to write stuff online, but people seem to like it because... I get a decent amount of circulation. Hmm. And you do have some uh, IT background, yes? Yes, I do. I am by trade a functional programmer. For any of the geeks watching who know how to interpret this, object-oriented programming is like trying to dance in a space suit. Give me functional, please, preferably a lisp. <laughs> I did not have an undergraduate background in IT, but the things I learned in philosophy translated fairly well in terms of some of the philosophy of mathematics, some of the logic and set theoretic background translates very well into certain systems. For example, SQL joins are essentially set theoretic operations. So the background in mathematics, philosophy, and fields adjacent thereto has served me well in comprehending concepts in information technology. And for understanding the mindset behind uh, people in IT, yes. <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk about uh, today, The uh, we see on social media all the time now uh, when we state something or bring it up, maybe we're just, it's just a joke or it's a meme. It's not necessarily anything to be taken seriously. A tag from the social media platform basically saying, um, you know, click here to find out more about the subject that was brought up. Um, so why why exactly do you think that they uh, social media companies feel the need to do this? I think it's a mixture of factors. I think that the biggest mistake that people make in analyzing phenomena like these are that they ascribe all of this to a single cause. If you're a person who trusts our institutions more, what is colloquially known as being blue-pilled, you will say something like, well, they're saying that because they want people to know the truth and misinformation is dangerous. If you're more of a, if you trust institutions less, if you're red-pilled or whatever, you might say something like, you might say something like, uh, well, they're just trying to censor anyone who goes off narrative. Now, I think that it's important to realize that there's a huge, huge institutional framework behind all of this. You've got social media companies, and this comes down to the opinions of the executives and senior management at a company, but also to whatever the media is saying at the time and to the extent to which the people at the social media company believe it, and very frequently to the decision of some person who probably makes 12 bucks an hour to sit at a computer and sort through this stuff. Um, and that's a huge thing. I don't think a lot of people understand that there's no... There is no infallible robot god of leftist logic that makes decisions about this stuff. There yeah. isn't. It's made by people who probably make less money than you do, sitting at computers and being berated for not processing enough material quickly enough. So be sure to apply Hanlon's razor. Do not attribute to malice that which can be reason uh, adequately explained by stupidity. So all For that example, being said, I, I want to I want to bring up that in, in relation to that, I did see one of those things where you say like, "What's your birth month?" and "What's your the first letter of your name?" One of those kind of graphics that was totally innocent, had nothing to do with politics or anything like that, and it had a a tag on it for 
you know, one of the big no-no subjects that you can't talk about without getting one of these tags. And I was like, how in the world did that happen? I like, I scrolled past it because I'm so used to seeing it. And then I was like, wait a minute, did I just see that on this totally unrelated post? And to some extent, I'm like, well, is that a, a flaw in the algorithm or is it a flaw with someone who, who wrote it and or is supposed to be looking at these things? Is it a case of who posted it and that's what's triggering it? Like, I, I have no idea. Like, from my perspective, I don't have a coding background, so I don't know what causes something like that to happen. <laughs> okay, I can explain a little bit about this. A lot of this stuff is done through a thing called a neural network, which is largely smoke and mirrors. Now, I'm sort of an AI skeptic. I tend to be very skeptical about what AI can and cannot do. And on some level, I think that artificial intelligence, when applied to present technology, is a misnomer. It's not AI. What it is is glorified linear regression. You have a scatter plot. You have a graph. You have a bunch of dots on the graph. And you make a program that can draw a line to separate the dots the way you want the two pieces. That's it. That's all that does. Now, as far as how this stuff works, these neural networks, there, there's lots of fancy stuff going on with terms like back propagation, where if something is wrong in this layer of nodes, it will propagate back and adjust the weights until it gets back to the inputs. But the, the best way to think about it probably is you have this giant pile, and I'm speaking figuratively here. Let's say you have a giant pile of circuits. You shoot it full of signals. You shoot it full of signals, and it... and it gives you an output. If it's not the output you want, then you shove a broomstick into it and stir it. Okay, another input. And you keep doing that until you get the output you want. And a lot of this stuff is exaggerated by people for marketing purposes. Uh, one thing that happens that I, know, that, that I know happens quite frequently is they'll take weaknesses of this kind of software and try to dress it up as strengths. So people will say things like, no one really knows what's going on inside of this software. It's too complex for the human mind to understand. And what that actually means is that this is a neural network that automatically adjusts its weights and it's so convoluted you can't tell what's going on in it. That doesn't mean it's some kind of superhuman intelligence because you might show it a picture of a cat and it will classify it as a fucking horse because it has four legs. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's the thing is AI can be stupid in a way that you wouldn't expect. It can be almost almost creatively stupid. And because of that, when you see one of those graphics, like you mentioned earlier, that's been flagged as wrong speak, it may very well be the case that the AI just derped really hard because it does derp really hard frequently. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, to me, it feels a lot like, um, uh, I don't, just unintelligent. Like I do have a marketing background, so to me, the whole idea of selling something's weaknesses and strengths totally just, yeah, I understand that. I, that concept is not new to me. And, um, and it's made me, I was already kind of like aware of that before I went into marketing. But once I went into marketing, I w uh, it, it black pilled me on how people sell things all the time. And uh, when someone tells me that, they can't understand how the program works. That just sounds bad to me. Like, even if they're selling it as, oh, it's so much smarter than you, it's so much more complex than you, that you, we don't. <laughs> Sorry, my cat Joys is of cat ass. ownership. Yes. <laughs> but anytime someone says that to me, that they say that, um, something is so much more complex that no one can understand it, even the people who made it. I'm like, that doesn't sound like a good thing. I don't care how you're trying to sell that to me. That doesn't sound like a positive, like, because I guess I can see past that, the BS, marketing BS behind that kind of messaging. Because to me, what it says, as someone who uh, frequently has to like uh, help people troubleshoot software and stuff is that what it says to me is that if there's a problem, we have no way of solving it. That's what that sounds like to me. And uh, that in, putting that on such a grand scale of social media sounds like a, a serious issue. <laughs> I, I wanted to say when you said if there's a problem, we can't solve it. But Alex, 
there are no problems because the AI is infallible. Now, nobody's going to come right out and say that. I am kind of straw manning a little bit, but there is this idea that if something comes from the AI, it is, if not unimpeachable, at least far beyond the grasp of mere mortals like yourself. So just listen to what us uh, insufferable Silicon Valley spurgs have to say about it, because we really understand it insofar as a mere meat person like us can understand the robot god. Uh, that, that, that's sort of how they are. And they do have their own goofy form of religion. You know, you have the singularity, which is basically the rapture for fucking nerds, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, I, I hope I'm not swearing too much. I have kind of a mouth like a sailor, and I am drinking a decent-sized can of Mike's Harder. This is an 8%er. Uh, but it's okay. I, but, but, but anyway, like, like, like I was saying, these there is this technocratic aspect where the incomprehensibility of AI is used to legitimize the decisions made by AI. Now, it's very possible that someone could pull some something really tricky and do something like this. They could, if, if I own a company that makes decisions based on AI, I could, if I wanted, have the AI generate a big list of options, including options that I know are going to be there, and then pick the one I like. Or I can pick the option I like and make sure the AI picks that one and say, well, this was generated by our highly specialized neural deep learning software. When really that's just a justification for doing whatever I want. And, and I'm not saying that anyone in particular has done this. I'm just saying that if you were in charge of a company that uses used AI, it would be very, very, very easy for you to do that. So... To me, this whole idea that relying on the AI to make decisions about human beings, um, like to some extent, we could talk about Dune and the um, the Butlerian Jihad, uh, why in the Dune world they don't use computers at all. Um, the uh, But that's such a serious case. But we're talking about something um, uh, that's not life and death. We're talking about technically, we're talking about people saying certain things. Um, basically, uh, the AI is saying, you can't say that. Um, in some instances, it is actually saying you can't say that because there are uh, AI bans. Like, um, the AI has flagged your account enough times to kick you off the social media. Uh, or it um, puts... I, I've seen this on Facebook where it puts something over the image, missing context or something like that, to, to which is a form of censorship. So to me, I, I, while that's not life and death necessarily on that on that Butlerian jihad level, it is highly serious that you cannot say certain things without getting gigged by what is essentially not a human being. But and has no, there's no human being to appeal to. Uh, I, I've, I know I've gone through the process of trying to talk to a person um, and and not gotten anyone ever. So, uh, and we see this in it, and that kind of lack of humanity uh, on in the in the case of like big corporations or big companies or big organizations is not a new idea and it's not something specific to censorship on social media it's a, it's a, just a problem of today getting a hold of a human being is really difficult but when it comes to something as serious as being able to say I think um, X about this political subject or, um, I found this study on this scientific subject. I want you to read it too. Uh, it's still it's it's serious in a way that has long term implications, not just for the in individual, but to society as a whole. And why do you think that that big that um, big tech social media thinks it's okay for them to take that on? I think there are a number of factors at play. In the first place, you have to understand, well, this goes back to what I said earlier. Let me start over. This goes back to what I said earlier, that it is a mistake to reduce this to one motive. Some of them are in it for the money. Some of them are truly devout wokists. 
some of them think they know what's best for other people and should be able to control them. Some of them think, some of them have this outlook that sounds sort of like this. Well, I don't really have any ideals of my own, but I'm in control of this infrastructure, so I'm just going to try and keep things working. You never know. And all four of those could probably be found in one company. Any given one of the FANG companies, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, probably has multiple people who all have those different outlooks. So it, it, can, it, it can be, when you ask what makes them think they can do that, that, that's kind of a question with a multifaceted answer. I don't want you to think that those four mindsets are supposed to be exhaustive. In fact, the first two are kind of the same. I was just kind of spitballing there, kind of improvising, like, here's some different outlooks that someone could take. And you could probably find dozens of different uh, opinions at a tech company. But crucially, even though people at a tech company might have many, many diverse kinds of opinions and think all kinds of different things, you have to remember that they are compelled to all profess the same, what you might call the same secular creed out loud. No one can contradict woke politics, and if you do, you're some clearly some kind of authoritarian. Uh -huh. um, now, regardless of the fact that what they do often is authoritarian. Well, in yes, nature. I mean <laughs> they're the sort of people who should be working in movie theaters because they're projecting. Uh, anyway, so. So, so they're all compelled to say the same thing. And the fact that they're all compelled to say the same thing tells you that the top brass probably march in lockstep. And I, I cannot say for certain that they do, but it certainly appears that way. Now, uh, to continue on with this a little bit, I when you ask what makes them feel that it's their right to be this way or to do these things, I want to say that it's a combination of factors. In the first place, there is elitism. There is a, a if you have ever spent significant amount of time around people from Southern California or the Northeast Corridor, which are the two major population centers of the United States on the coasts, you will find that they are consumed by hubris. You know, th there is this very... At first I thought they were joking, but then I realized they were serious and it completely floored me. Where You're talking about a group of people who, honest to God, believes that they are entitled to remake the world in their own image. People from certain places in the country, especially when they're well off, especially when they're in a high status industry like tech or academia or finance, especially when they've decided to be woke, have this mindset that they are uniquely qualified to not dictate, because that's a very mean word, to shepherd the rest of us. Which is... A very Christian word. Um, <laughs> well, liberalism the, is the bastard. American liberalism is the bastard child of Calvinism, anyway. <laughs> it's just a secular version of Calvinism. It has original sin. Original sin is the idea that people are born broken and fundamentally can only redeem themselves by joining a certain social movement, and that would be uh, Calvinism or Calvinist Christianity or social justice. Uh, they have a tenet of Calvinism called unconditional election, which means that it's just by accident of birth that a person is elect or not elect, where people who are oppressed are morally superior by virtue of the fact that they are oppressed. They have total depravity, which is another Calvinist tenet. In Calvinism, total depravity in Calvinist theology means that everyone is intrinsically evil to the point where they cannot even desire to do good of their own accord unless God helps them. So and this in, in, in wokeism shows up as subconscious bias. You are subconsciously biased, so everything you do is somewhat racist. It's very much like total depravity in Calvinism. So to some extent, would you say that the people who think that they have a right to do that, to control uh, the things we say on social media, 
Do you think that they believe because of their beliefs that they are better off to tell us when we've stepped outside of the bounds? Well, following Calvinism, unconditional election dictates that whether you are elect is beyond your own choice. I just am elect. I'm just lucky. And it, given my background, I tend to think that Calvinists are suffering from a very acute sort of unwarranted self-importance, not to mention false modesty. Oh, I'm elect. It's not anything of my own doing. It's not, I didn't choose to be better than everyone else, <laughs> is what it boils down to. But so, with the Silicon Valley people, to answer your question a little more closely, to address it seriously, I would say that it's reciprocal. It is very useful to believe that you are elect and can dictate to everyone else because it gives you power. But you can also, uh, having adopted this belief system, you find that it's self-justifying. So I can believe I am one of the woke people whose job it is to enlighten the ignorant masses and my belief system tells me that I'm right. And because this belief system gives me power, I can take that as evidence that I'm right. And because the people in power are woke, I can take it as evidence that wokeism is correct. It, it's self-reinforcing. Not exactly a circular argument, more of a circular phenomenon. It, it nobody kinda, in the right mind. Go ahead. It kind of reminds me of the divine order that uh, English monarchy used to believe, the idea that um, you, because you were king or the monarch, you had absolute power except under God, and it was divine that you were at your place, and as such, everybody had to follow what you did, and uh, you were no, you were noble morally by virtue of your position only. So that leaves you open to failing morally, failing morally when you. Uh, you think everything you do is okay, you, is, you know, ordained by God, essentially. Well, there's an, it's interesting you should bring that up because that is not only the English, that is most of medieval Europe. There is, an, there is a historical note here that is important to make, that is relevant. Christianity provided something like job security <laughs> for heathen European kings. If I'm Olaf Redson or whatever, and I'm the Jarl of some podunk place in southern Norway in the 800s, it makes a lot of sense for me to convert to Christianity. Because as things are right now, if somebody wants what I have, they can just come up and stick a knife in my back and take it. But if I convert to Christianity and all my men convert to Christianity and all the people around us convert to Christianity, I can go, ah, 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 divine right. God put me here. If you kill me, you are in contempt of the divine. And everybody goes, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And then I'm safe. It's job security. And wokeism provides something very similar for the ruling class in our society. Wokeism provides this sort of... Uh, this unimpeachable moral authority. So long as you virtue signal and say the right things... Everything you do will be painted in the best possible light. Any bad thing you do must be minimized. And everything you do is for the sake of social justice. So it creates job security for people because it makes them seem morally impeachable. You know, Joe Biden had some very fairly credible sexual assault allegations made against him. And he got away with it because he's on the left. And if he virtue signals hard enough, it doesn't matter. That's yeah. the power of wokeism. So we're seeing this sort of uh, protection of the elite trickle down into the effect that we don't have that protection. We don't, uh, and this is completely counter to the modern idea of freedom of speech, of, you know, you have the right to your opinion, no matter who you are, the lack of nobility that America was built on. In fact, that was like one of the biggest things they told states they couldn't do was make someone noble. Like you can't, that's every man is equal, essentially was, you know, it, which meant every man had the ability to have his uh, First Amendment rights. So everyone could say what they thought, whether or not it was right or whether or not it was um, 
uh, like right from a perspective of truth or right from a perspective of morality. It didn't matter. You had the right to say it. So the problem uh, with that is that if you think that some people are are untouchable morally, you that means you think some people are. You can, you know, attack their First Amendment rights if you think some people on the opposite side can never have their First Amendment right, rights taken away from them. And this is this. This is a scary prospect for for a person who is not elite, obviously. Um, for the for those of us who are not at the top, who want to say things, and maybe it's just a joke. <laughs> maybe it's just a joke, and you're not you're not even like trying to make any kind of serious commentary. Uh, you're that being impinged by people who think it's okay to do that is and have the power to do so and have, uh, have been told that they're allowed to do it, that's pretty serious. Um, it may seem minor, but it, I, it feels like a death by a thousand cuts to me. Uh, that these, that, and to some extent, just labeling something as misinformation, you're not, ta- you're not telling people that they can't say it at that point, but it does lay the groundwork to eventually saying they can't say it. And we have seen social media companies recently come out and say, no, you can't say that anymore. If you say that, we will take it down. Yes, and this has trickled into law enforcement. In Australia, there are videos you can find on Twitter of Australian police coming and knocking on someone's door with screenshots of their social media posts, which don't incite violence or say anything really objectionable, but it says, oh, well, you said you were criticizing the government. Why is that? It's very totalitarian. It's the sort of thing that would have been unthinkable two years ago. Why do you think they've turned up the heat, uh, to put it as a metaphor, in the last couple of years? Two reasons. uh, First of all, to paraphrase an American politician named Rahm Emanuel, never let a serious crisis go to waste. If there's a crisis, you always use that as a means of pushing through as much change as you possibly can. Second of all, it seems to me that our ruling class is a little bit antsy, and this is due to the rise of populism. Now, the media and adjacent institutions puts a lot of, or put a lot of effort into painting populists as Nazis or racists or rednecks or evil, stupid dirt people from flyover country who aren't smart enough to make their own decisions, so let's make their decisions for them. There's an app for that, you know. (laughs) Um, But populism has been gaining ground recently because, well, there's a lot of complex socioeconomic stuff going on over the past few decades that explains it. To make a long story short, the neoliberal free trade policies of the United States over the past few decades has screwed the American working class so hard that they have been willing to do absurd things like vote for Donald Trump. And if you confront someone, if you confront a bourgeois person about this, someone who is upper middle to upper class and has a prestigious profession and so on, they will insist that the only reason any of those dumb hicks in flyover country vote the wrong way is because they're either stupid or racist. The idea that anyone outside of the coast could have legitimate grievances with Washington is just completely foreign to them. And I may have uh, fallen that way when I was younger, uh, almost, because I do live in a city that's close to California, that we get a lot of Californians out here. But I went to Kansas for eight years, and I really paid attention uh, to them as individuals and saw exactly how how much policies in large cities hurt them and and I realized that the whole the the tirade the the poisoning of the well, which is what these tags are in the first place they are poisoning the well um what they the poisoning of the well of saying that they vote against their interests was just not true 
it, it it's like their interests are not this do not align the same way as what these people want them to align them to that's the difference um and also a big part of that is that they say it's ignorance of the rural people and that's why they vote the way they do and it's like seeing how ignorant most people in large cities are of how life is in rural communities i'm like nah, i think it's ignorance on your part on why you don't understand why they vote the way they vote and the things that they value i i, I think it has more to do with the fact that you've probably taken a day trip out to the boonies and that's about it <laughs> and um like, for example, the fact that most, a big chunk of rural America does not have reliable internet or internet at all. And so a lot of people are like, how do they not notice these things happening? Um, and it's like, well, because they're not on social media. A lot of them aren't. Like the, the, the whole axiom Twitter is not the real world is true. It is very, very true. Um, Twitter is not indicative of the American people. It's not, e it's not even indicative of the entire world. It's probably mostly indicative of um, urbanites, uh, not necessarily just in the US even. So to me, um, it feels a lot like um, this idea that what we see on social media is fake. We say this often, but I don't think enough people really have it in their face, which is why people end up shocked when voting goes a certain way, like with Brexit or with 2016. I, they're shocked. And it's like, well, it's because online isn't everything. Like we're online right now. And uh, we're online trying to get the word out to people and to get convince people about certain ideas we want them to do and, and say. Um, but I think to, to a large extent, um, some people have decided not to be online and some people d do not have the opportunity to be online. And that means no social media. That means they don't see the poisoning of the well. And that's probably mostly a good thing for them <laughs> and for the world at large. Well, God bless Elon Musk for launching Starlink and getting it up and running, which I think he will in fairly short order, because that's going to bring high-speed internet to frickin' everybody over the next 10 years. And I'm really excited about it. God bless Elon Musk. <laughs> uh, that He's one of the few oligarchs I actually kind of sort of like. Anyway, um, in response to your point about what urbanites think about rural people, there is a guy on Quora whose name is Habib Fani. He's an African immigrant, identifies as liberal, but is a bit less echo-chambered, let's say, than a lot of the other liberals on the internet. And he says this, it's a cultural thing. Liberals, when, when asked, why do people in rural communities vote Republican? He says, liberals tell rural people that their guns are stupid, that their God is stupid, that their occupations in extractive industries are stupid, that their lack of environmentalism is stupid, that their trucks is stupid, that their hunting is stupid, and that they themselves are stupid and racist homophobes. The liberals then say, hey, stupid, your life is shit. How would you like a little increased spending in the social safety net? So the rural voters reply this, and it's just a picture of a hand flipping the bird. <laughs> He's not wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of like him. Yeah. I disagree with him about pretty much everything, but he's a little bit less oblivious than your average lib. I will give him that. Yeah, that's, I, I'd say he's pretty right about that. I mean, I, I said this about um, pop culture actually recently from out of Hollywood. Uh, well, actually two two or three years ago, I said this uh, in, a, in a movie review that um, when like a, a company like Disney or so-and-so keeps goes on a tirade about how stupid and wrong the fans are and the customers are and then they go go see our movie that doesn't work and i feel like it to some extent what he's describing is the same thing and how uh the democrat party teach cr treats uh you know rural communities is that it's like oh you're stupid and uh the things you want are stupid and you're a bad person and vote for us and it's like that's not that's not like uh, even with a marketing background i'm going why would anyone 
except that I, I compared it to going into McDonald's and saying, and, and the and the person behind the counter going, "You're a big fat ass, and I hate your guts. Buy a Happy Meal." And we don't. No, I'm going to Wendy's <laughs> and like walking out because it's you. No, you're not going to go with the people who treat you like crap, and that's to some extent, I think why we have these other social media platforms popping up is that people are getting banned. People are getting these weird gigs on their account, like the, the tags that we've been talking about. And they go, I want to go someplace that doesn't do that. I want to go someplace that doesn't tell me I can't talk about these subjects. I want to be able to talk about them. So then they, they find the pro uh, freedom of speech, uh, you know, platforms and basically, the big tech social media is creating an environment where their um, competition is going to flourish by saying, you can't say these subjects, you can't talk about this, you can't, you can't go against what we think you should say. Like, it, it's basically saying, uh, you know, go, go find your own space. And it's like, all right, and people literally went and found their own space. It's like, I don't know why you would think that they wouldn't walk out the door. They are walking out the door. Uh, sometimes you're shoving them out the door into the arms of your competition. And, and those arms happen to be far more loving <laughs> than yours ever were. And, and in the social ahead. media at this point, the social media companies essentially fang is a monopoly, but it's not going to last forever. Monopolies never do. 30 years ago, people thought IBM was at the top dog and always would be forever because people are extremely short-sighted and have the memories of goldfish. Now, that being said, they are trying to kneecap their competitors. They've tried to get Gab offline so many times, I can't even tell you the lengths they've gone through to try and get rid of Gab. The guy who owns Gab, Andrew Torba, I think his name is, has been basically blacklisted from every bank in the country by some mysterious... For some mysterious reading, no bank reason, no bank will take him. And this is where I think woke people will say something like, well, of course they don't want to take a guy like that, but they don't realize it's not actually about that someone told them. Now, that being said, I think that we are at the point where we're at a tipping point. Because on the one hand, I want to say the black-pilled way to come at this is to say, well, the only place where anybody gets any traction or actually gets any viewers is on mainstream social media. So once you're banned from there, you're screwed. What's the point of having a bit shoot or a gab or a minds.com account or something like that? But the fact of the matter is, or, or like rumble or some such thing. But the fact of the matter is that those platforms do have millions and millions of users and they're a great place to address the right. So if you have some message that you would like the right to hear, that's a great place to do it. Because otherwise and, you're just screaming into the void. They're not going to hear you because they're not on Twitter or Facebook well, or whatever. Are, but increasingly <laughs> they're not, if you yeah. get my drift. <laughs> and as the right grows to in, in, grows and grows and that label steadily comes to encompass anyone who is not a raging wokist, well, <laughs> they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. And this idea, I, I, I don't know, I don't buy the doom and gloom and I don't buy the black pill. I don't think... I mean, right now, 2020 was 2016 for the left. And that means 2024 is going to be 2016 for the right squared. You know, Ron Paul was the right asking nicely. Trump was the right being somewhat more assertive. I don't think you want to see what comes next. Sounds scary. But I, I mean, to some extent, they, I, I feel like there needs to be pushback. Um, because I'm a centrist, I'm a hard believer in having the left and the right fighting each other at all, all the time, basically because then they're not messing with us. And the same is true for the government and, uh, big companies. I want them at each other's throats because then they're not coming for us. Uh, <laughs> and, um, it, because a lot of people think that, um, uh, in some, like one of them is on your side. And it's like, I, I don't know about that. I, I'm not so sure. I, I'm pretty sure they're on their side. <laughs> yes. 
I mean, my whole point, one point that I've made frequently over the past few years, and I've made this with increasing frequency and stridence over the past year, is that the far right is effectively non-existent. The far right is four guys in a meth lab in Arkansas, three of whom are named Cletus, and one of whom is their tweaker friend who is on parole. <laughs> what far right? Are there, People think Trump is far right. Trump is a Democrat from the 90s. In terms of his policies, oh, he said mean things on Twitter. Okay, look at his policies. Show me one policy he, he enacted that remotely qualifies as far right. There aren't any. That 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 pause on immigration from Islamic countries that he put into place, that was floated by advisors in the Obama administration. They didn't act on it, but they considered it. He, it's just so patently absurd to assume that there is any politically significant far right in this country. There is no politically viable far right. There is no politically viable Nazi party. The Ku Klux Klan is a fucking joke. They had millions of members in the 1920s, and now they're less than 8,000 countrywide. They're a running gag in American pop culture for a good reason. Neo-Nazis are both mostly a bunch of amphetamine addicts who, you know, overdosing, doing snowballs of fentanyl and meth and running petty drug operations from inside of prison with the Aryan Brotherhood. There's no far right that's going to take over the country. The fascists of the 1930s were an extremely organized, very deadly, very motivated, and very well-funded group of people in Europe. That doesn't exist anymore. So this, this ridiculous shadow boxing that progressives do with an imaginary Nazi foe is just... It, it's just ludicrous. There is no such thing. And screaming the words, screaming words like Nazi, racist, and fascist over and over again is just a means of shutting people up whom they would rather not speak. But they've overused it. It's sort of like a, um, you know, the boy who cried wolf at this point. We keep hearing them call people Nazis. We keep hearing them call people racist, who some of whom we've met, and th some people we've we've read their their work. And and then they want us to believe that. And it's like, well, I my brain tells me otherwise. I, you know, critical thinking based on the things that they say and believe and how they act. It's not true. Critical thinking is a dangerous <laughs> vector of mis misinformation, Alex. Critical thinking, as we've been taught to use it, can lead us to the wrong conclusions. You should trust the experts. Well, and I've said this before. But uh, experts are for hire, and they have always been for hire. Uh, I, I figured this out when dealing with an Ansel Adams court case. Uh, so it had nothing to do with politics. Uh, it was just both sides had their Ansel Adams expert, and they both said the opposite thing. And that's the problem with appealing to expertise is an appeal to, an, to authority, for one thing. Um, because you're you're just you're over supporting the institutions at that point when you when all you believe is expertise. Now, here's the thing that I'm more likely to accept the credibility of a hobbyist at this point because hobbyists have a passion, and the pro the the issue when it comes to a hobbyist is that they're not being being paid for this. They're not being paid for what they're studying what they're investigating they're just doing it out of love this is or voracious appetite on the subject so i'm i'm far more likely at this point to believe a hobbyist than i am someone who's being paid to tell me what they think um and and i think that's and the the assault on avocation as a source of um of intelligence of of knowledge is is at this point it's it's dangerous. We shouldn't we shouldn't completely toss out avocation as a source of intelligence. It's not a it's not a good idea. I mean, a lot of the basis of our science, of our literature, of a lot of things that we we claim to value ha have a lot of foundation in avocation. Yes. 
And I would pursue that a little further. There was a book written some years ago, and there's a sub stack that in turn was written about this book. Some guy, I, he was a PhD, I believe, looked at the geopolitical predictions made by people with PhDs in political science and looked at the same sorts of geopolitical predictions made by educated laymen. So not quite a raving drunk on the street or your Uncle Bob's Facebook wall, but you know, an educated layman. What he found was that the PhDs in political science were unable to predict geopolitical events with accuracy any greater than the educated laymen. Because in many cases, the putative expertise that is being deferred to simply does not exist. There is no such thing as an expert in politics. Economics is not a science. There is no workable model of the economy. Nobody can predict what in interest rates are going to do in a week, let alone 10 years from now. There, there is no consensus whatsoever in economics. There is no consensus whatsoever in psychology, much less something like sociology, or if there is a consensus, it's purely ideological, 50%, 50% of psychological findings fail to replicate, meaning if you do the experiments again, they don't get the same results anymore because they weren't scientific to begin with. And there are many, many more holes that you can poke into the social sciences. For example, after World War II, when we defeated several nations full of fascists, psychologists began to develop this idea of the authoritarian personality as if it were some pathology or mental illness to be authoritarian because we needed to delegitimize any possible remaining vestiges of the fascism which we had defeated, and we did so using psychology. In the Soviet Union, there was a thing called sluggish schizophrenia, and you can Google that, sluggish schizophrenia, where people who disputed anything the regime said would be diagnosed with a slow-acting form of schizophrenia called sluggish schizophrenia hmm. that would that was held to have symptoms that manifested slowly, so you needed to be put away for your own good. The United States does similar things. Rat people on the radical left and radical right have been diagnosed with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or what have you as a, way, as a means of discrediting them. That happened to Valerie Solanas, who was a radical feminist. It happened to Ted Kaczynski, who was an anarcho-primitivist. It happened to Anders Bering Breivik, who was right-wing. So people from all different points on the political compass have fallen victim to this punitive use of psychology. So I've critiqued economics and psychology, but you know, you, you can compare that to the natural sciences. The nat whereas the social sciences are downstream of society, whereas the social sciences do whatever they go wherever the ruling class goes, the natural sciences are quite the opposite. The natural sciences don't care what you think, and very often the ruling class itself has had to yield to natural science. Another uh, again, once again, the the Soviet Union is a great example of this. For a long time, the Soviet leadership rejected Einsteinian physics because that was bourgeois physics, bourgeois physics, the physics of the upper middle class, the physics of capitalism. But then they had this problem. They went, "Oh, wait a minute. If we say relativity isn't real, then we can't build nuclear weapons." And they started believing in relativity real fucking quick because that's the only way they can make nukes. Because natural science does not care what you think. Society is downstream of natural science, whereas social science is downstream of society. And I think that's really telling about the degree of truth that you can find in it. So this um, is, we, we've been going over like essentially why uh, experts, which is somewhat what we're seeing with these tags is experts say sometimes it's like, Oh, just click on the link to go see what the experts say. This group of experts, the ones that we've pr approved of, you know, who's we, I'm not sure always, um, uh, big tech. Sometimes the social media platform itself approves of these experts or mainstream media is, it's, is approving of these experts, you know, it kind of depends. Um, but so, this is a, this is related to what to the main subject of the of the video that uh, expertise being up for grabs money wise is affecting this because we can see that people are trying to share experts who disagree the non consensus and it's not it's they're not letting them or if they are letting them they're putting the tag to the experts that they do agree with and. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, like, I, I find this very insidious is that it's like science, 
real science is supposed to be about questioning things, questioning um, findings, like constantly. You're, you're supposed to question the world around you and you're supposed to question the findings of your fellow scientists. It, because, as you said, 50% of them f fail to yield the same results when when the study is done and um, you know again that's really that's a bad rate of failure but it does tell you something that you know they are retesting it and if they are retesting it and they're finding that this you know x hypothesis we thought was true is not true okay i guess we have to throw it out and it, and and this is why to some extent people are mad because like six months ago you were telling us we couldn't say this and now you're telling us we can say it. And that's really frustrating from the perspective of someone who does not have like a, a fish memory. <laughs> Those of us with more elephant like memories uh, are like, I'm not, I'm not okay with the fact that you told me six months ago, I couldn't say this. And now you're telling me I can like or that I have to. Yeah, or that I have to, telling me I have to say something. Like I'm I'm not okay with it just because you've you've finally caught up to it because it's a difference of value. Um what is being valued? The value of um the correct information versus the value of the ability to talk about all the information. Like those of us who don't like the tags, we believe in the latter. Uh, those who make the tags believe in the former. <laughs> so that's why we're betting heads. Yes. Yes. And I understand what you mean by experts can be up for grabs. You can fire a group of doctors or chemists or science or physicists or biologists and have them prove whatever you want. So there is that aspect of expertise. But what I would like to draw attention to is this whole other class of experts, not experts for hire, not like I have money, so I'm going to hire an expert, but I have money, so I will create an expert. There are entire classes of quote unquote experts that are that were essentially created in order to rationalize policy. What is a think tank except a bunch of people getting together, scheming up ways for their benefactors, their the people who bankrolled them to succeed, and coming up with rationalizations for it? The model of contemporary science is not the guy in the 1700s questing after truth that's long gone, or the people, if there are still people like that, they're not welcome in academia. The model of contemporary science is the think tank. And in large part, think tanks were conceived of by conservatives because once they realized that universities were dominated by the left, they needed some answers, so they began to create think tanks. I think they need to do something similar with art. And if you can't see the social utility of that, you are obviously too stupid to make decisions. What art? Some why are the curtains blue literary bullshit? What kind of touchy-feely is this? Shut up. Get out. You are not fit to make decisions that impact society. You're some myopic spurg that should be writing code somewhere. Art shapes culture. Art has a huge ripple effect on culture. When someone finds it compelling, when it pulls on the strings of the human soul, so to speak, Art is extremely powerful and can be an agent of change. The fact that conservatives do not fund art in any reasonable way, except maybe to preserve art galleries, which is fine. You know, they preserve art galleries and they fund orchestras, but why do they not patronize artists and help them succeed and get them funding and marketing? Why don't they do that? They should. I, I guess they like losing. <laughs> well, I mean, as I, I've, I've brought this up before, but the literary, the contemporary literary world is completely dominated by the progressive politics by woke ideology. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm not trying to break into the literary novel. Uh, I'm still writing my literary novels, but I'm not trying to like push them onto uh, traditional publishing because I just don't believe that they care to publish work that is not on message anymore. Uh, having read like 50 contemporary novels in a row, most of them by debut authors, I realized that they didn't care. Uh, and I, it's almost impossible. You try to do a, a, an internet search to find an, a non-woke publisher, you're not going to find one. It's Instead, you'll get results for woke publishers. Uh, <laughs> like, no, the, the opposite of that. Although, thank you for the, the list of publishers I'm not going to uh, patron. <laughs> 
But um, yeah, I do. I do think you're right. I do think that they should be pushing uh, a counter, an actual counterculture. Like we see it on social media. We see creators on like YouTube like this, um, not, not even just conservative, but like even centrist, even um, people anyone trying to be. Anyone who's not woke. Yeah, anyone who's not woke, essentially. You see people like that out there pushing these ideas um, like in social media. You see them pushing it in nonfiction like crazy. They, they hit that button hardcore, but we're not seeing it a lot in art. Um, movies, TV shows, music. Um, I hope to have some uh, uh, non-woke uh, music people on here soon. Um, uh, and because part of me wants to get people to pay attention to these these non-woke options, uh, because I don't I don't want to just be doom and gloom. I know that these people are out there. I know that they're making work. I know that they're trying to make it. Uh, I know a poet who might be good on this channel. I'll give you his name after. Okay, thank you. So like, I'm, I know they're out there. And uh, the thing is though, they do need exposure because they're not, getting, they're not getting the exposure from the traditional methods. The institutions that are supposed to bring culture to you are not bringing these people to people, to, to the public. Um, I, I know because I am one of them and it's one of the reasons why I stopped trying. Um, and I would, I would like people to see more of that. Now, part of that has to do with social media. We have to push them on social media. Like every time you find a, a, a non-woke writer or non-woke poet or um, musician, follow them, push their work, you know, tell people you think Especially they're awesome. They've been censored. Like, uh, yes. this is Massey. Joseph Massey, yes. Yeah, especially if they've answer. they've, especially if they've been hit by a cancellation campaign, um, I do think you need to do that. Um, when it comes to the actual tags, I feel to some extent the you know the go find our approved message tags essentially. I do think um, we need to do something about it, um, even if it is just to. Um, Troll it, essentially. Uh, try to get it to look absurd. Because uh, this is a pretty good example. Uh, last year, during the Maricopa, like, were there Sharpies involved? Could you use Sharpies on your ballot? Which I'm in Maricopa, by the way. Um, so I had a Maricopa ballot. Uh, there, there were tags. There were those uh, misinformation tag P, uh, things about the Maricopa ballots and Sharpies. So uh, people started trolling it. They were like, um, oh, I am uh, filling out, um, uh, uh, I'm writing a letter with a Sharpie with my Maricopa ballot next to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, like in, in trying to get it to pop up using different words to just even though they weren't saying the thing that it was supposed to be countering and i feel like to some extent we need to do that we need to to make it look as stupid as possible because it is stupid and and to some extent it is built on ai and shitty ai at that probably <laughs> Well, it's sort of like how what Martin Luther said about Satan, you know. If you can't get him to go away by praying, you can always just make fun of him because he's self-absorbed and he hates being mocked. <laughs> and I think much can, the same can be said of the woke, that they are utterly humorless. And being possessed of their own thoroughly puritanical re religion, which Luther would probably not have approved of, <laughs> but being possessed of their own thoroughly puritanical religion, they are completely humorless. They are uh, dead serious about everything, and they absolutely cannot stand being made fun of. And I think that woke fragility is a large part of why social media and why the left has become so completely censorious. It's the fact that they're so fragile, even the slightest bit of off-narrative messaging will throw them into an existential crisis, let alone if you make fun of them directly. Syra Rao is a billionaire heiress. She's married to a billionaire. She has tens of thousands of Twitter followers, but she blocked me because I made fun of her. 
because people are that fragile. I don't block anybody on Twitter unless they're spamming me. I only block them if they're like threatening violence or trying to clearly trying to find out more information about me. You know, like they're really like going, trying to like possibly moving towards doxing me. That's the only time I'm like, okay, I, I got to protect myself here. But other, like, to be honest with you, I feel like uh, blocking is better as a move than it is to go Twitter, kick this person off. Like that is way worse. Um, like, okay, fine. You don't want to hear them talk anymore. Just block them or mute, or mute them. You could mute them. That way you don't ever have to hear them again. Uh, but uh, when you basically go to mommy and daddy, which is why are you treating big tech like mommy and daddy in the first place? Uh and say uh, tattletale to them that, oh, they weren't treating me how I wanted to be treated. And it's like, I'm sorry, are you an adult? If you're an adult, could you act like an adult? And could you stop asking giant uh, institutions and corporations and state actors to act like your parent? <laughs> the rest of us want to be treated as adults. Do you remember the Wild West days of the internet when it was an adult space? <laughs> <laughs> when you could go onto Facebook and make a fake name and troll the ever loving fuck out of Facebook groups and like go in and be like, hey guys, have you ever tried getting AIDS on purpose? Not that I would ever do anything like that. <laughs> oh God. I feel like there used to be a lot more fun on the internet. Now it, it feels way more serious. Um, and I can't tell the difference between satire and real woke people anymore. It's almost impossible. It's like, is this one satire or is this one real? Like some people are really, really good at satire and, um, some people are really, really insane. So it's really hard to make that distinction now. Um, and, and that's generally speaking, if you see something and you're not sure, is this woke satire or a real woke person, rest assured that even if it is satire, there's probably someone who actually believes that. In fact, probably a significant number of people who do. Yeah, terrifyingly. Uh, so um, do you have any last uh, bits of insight for us on these tags, on these companies before we wrap up? I think... Well, here's a little nugget of wisdom I put in a book I once wrote and then unpublished because I was so embarrassed by it. For what that's worth, you have a mountain. The mountain goes like this. It goes up, there's a little dip, and then it goes up again, and there's a little dip, and then it goes up to the summit. So you have an ant. The ant is crawling up the mountain. It goes into the little dip. It might say, oh, well, this is it. We've gone over the high point. Now we're headed back down. We're going back down into the valley, and all is lost not realizing that this is just a divot on the way further up. Because and because the perspective of the ant is limited. And I think it's very important to remember that human emotion is very short range in the sense that it, it tends to assume that the present situation is how things have always been and will always be. And this can create issues. One place where it definitely creates issues is that people assume that because things have been this way since June of 2020, they're going to always be this way and we're completely finished. And I can't help but roll my eyes at how short-sighted that is. The idea that we've lost, and by we, I mean anyone who isn't woke, or that there's this total ascendancy of woke ideology and nothing will ever be the same again. I'm sorry, it's horse shit. Even with all the vaccine mandates, even with all the stuff going on in Australia, even with all the other things, it, it's all, this can all change in the blink of an eye. It all did change in the blink of an eye. There's nothing that can, that will stop it from changing again. So never, all, always take a long-term view and never underestimate the speed at which things can change. And remember that a lot of the rational cognition going on up here is driven by these irrational emotions. And these irrational emotions are anchored in the present. So your cognition is fundamentally shackled to an understanding, a pre-rational understanding of how things are right now. And in order to get around that, you have to purposefully bracket it. You have to purposefully do things and think things that feel a little bit irrational to you right now. And you might find that you're more optimistic after that and you're not so black-billed. So you're saying there's hope. <laughs> yes. All right. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on, Caleb. I, I feel like uh, we we went a little off topic, but a lot of there's so much going on. There's so much involved in all of this. Some some stuff that's so big picture that you know you can't help it. It's interconnected. So thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about these tags and what might be behind them and the, even the, the functionality of them. Uh, and uh, if you guys all watching at home, could walk your fingers over to the like and subscribe button, I would really appreciate it. This has been 451 Degrees, the censorship podcast on the Unsafe Space Network. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now. And you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and scheduled for ideological vaccination. To avoid cancellation, please update your ideological contact tracing app on your smart device immediately. Here's a fun fact. Only vaccinated black lives matter. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't think about it, I mean, that's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice, Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake. <laughs>